hey, we're getting closer to Halloween, and I can see just based on which feature Fridays are getting watched currently, that people are in the mood for those kind of darker atmospheric reads. And I thought this would be a perfect time to talk about some of the books in the past that have scared me personally. Because you may have noticed if you've been here for a second, you're kind of getting a sense of my reading taste. And I undoubtedly gravitate toward darker, atmospheric, creepier books, especially in the fall, as I think we all do to some level. However, you may also know, or not, and now you will, that I am actually a huge scaredy cat. I do not watch horror movies. I am easily manipulated by mood music. I used to have to creep out of my room at night if my dad left the TV on too loud and it moved into some of the tenser late night programming. And growing up in the 90s at the height of Goosebumps, I did not read a single Goosebumps book. However, while at the babysitter, I did put my head under a couch for an entire Goosebumps movie. So with that being said, you will never find me in a haunted house. And so I've actually been surprised that the last couple of years I have been reading a lot of books that are being classified as horror because I don't necessarily seek out things that I think will scare me. However, like I said, I'm still attracted to things like gothics. I'm attracted to ghosts. And so it's like walking this fine line of being interested in these themes and these settings and these atmospheres spheres, but not wanting to lose sleep over anything I'm reading. If anyone can relate, please let me know below. However, at the same time, I've read books like Bird Box when it first came out, and everyone was talking about how scary it was. And I read it, even despite the fact that everyone was talking about how scary it was. I know, sometimes I make no sense, and sometimes I do give in to peer pressure. And yet, I didn't necessarily find that book as much scary as tense. So with all that being said, I thought it would be an interesting exercise to kind of go through and look at some of the books that I do remember scaring me in some way. However, because I don't gravitate to horror, you're probably not going to see quite as many of the like expected horror titles in this list. Additionally, because this is a list that really leans in to my personal reading experience, this may also have more personal anecdotes than like literary analysis. So do with that as you will. Before we jump all the way in, go ahead and like and subscribe if you feel like it. And also let me know some of the books that have scared you in the comments because I'm very interested in how we all kind of respond to literary horror differently and what kind of puts us in that scared mindset in literature where we one can step away to our overactive imaginations are at play in some aspects but also we don't necessarily have some of those influences like mood music like particular shots and jump scares still exist as my friend Sarah Hollowell has proved to me but they clearly operate a little bit differently also because I'm not a traditional deeply read horror reader I am not making any observations about horror as a genre here these are just some of the books that have creeped me out starting with a couple from back in high school that have oddly enough kind of stayed with me and the first is Memnock the Devil by Anne Rice now is this a part of the vampire Chronicles. Yes. Have I read Interview with a Vampire or any of the other books in this series? No. Which I know is weird because I was very much into vampires when I was a teenager and well before and after Twilight. So to my best recollection what happened here, because I did check it out of my high school library, which is notable because my high school library didn't have a particularly robust selection. I didn't really use it all that much. I very much relied on my public libraries. But I think what happened is that we were editing the school yearbook well into the summer. There was a group of us that would be like in the library a couple of weeks into the summer finishing the yearbook and we would have like movie marathons while we were working on spreads. And one of the movies I was half watching while working on a spread was Interview with a Vampire. And so I think I was in middle school at this time. I was clearly interested in this after the movie and the library only had Memnock the Devil. It didn't have any of the other books in the series. And so I was like, sure, I'll read it. And I did. I don't know why. I could not tell you anything about that book except what scared me. I remember being in my bed reading this and I believe it was at the beginning of the book there was just this imagery of the devil just kind of like following a character and it was just this idea of these footsteps and just that thing lurking in the dark and especially at this time I lived in the country my window like faced out into well it faced out onto a road but this idea that anything could be out there that 
was very much playing in to my reading experience and it scared the poop out of me. I remember distinctly having to put the book down for the night, but that is all I remember about this book. And I do think it's interesting because a lot of the reactions I come back to again and again in terms of what scares me while reading is reading at night and having to put the book down for the night because something about that late night fuzzy brain where your walls are kind of down, there's a little bit of a thinning of the barrier between real and imaginary where things will just become scarier in your own mind even while reading. And in that spirit, moving on to the kind of most traditional horror novel we have on this list, we have Salem's Lot by Stephen King, which for Stephen King fans may not be the scariest book in his catalog. But again, I was a teenager. Vampires were in vogue both culturally and in my own reading preferences. And this was his vampire book, so I was going to read it. And it creeped me out, particularly the idea of how the vampires operated in this book, the idea that they would be at your window scratching and whispering your name. Now here is where I messed up. I was at a movie night with a bunch of friends at someone's house and I was basically tricked into watching scarier movies than I would have normally agreed to. They did admittedly tone it down for me, but for me it was still a lot. And I made the rookie mistake amongst my friends of telling them about this book, how it freaked me out, and what in this book freaked me out. Now keep in mind, this movie night was 30 minutes away from my home. Like it was in a town or two over. And so I had to drive back through the country at night to get home after watching some of these creepy movies. So I get home, I'm sitting in my room, I'm watching something on my laptop to kind of unwind. I have my door locked because I'm a teenager. And all of a sudden, I see a face at my window. Now remember, I am in the country. There is a neighbor across the street, but I have woods on one side, a field on the other. There is nothing around. And then all of a sudden, face, my name, and scratching. And I scream bloody murder. This is also the moment where some of my illusions of safety were a little bit broken because I storm out of my room. Because at this point, I've realized it's my friends. My dad is just standing befuddled in the hallway, not knowing what to do, but just kind of staring at my door. My mom hasn't even woken up. So I go barreling out onto the porch, which is where they were. So admittedly, they did have direct access to me, but I couldn't figure out how they got to my house. And keep in mind, most of them drove 30 minutes to do this how they got to my house without me seeing them because I would have seen their headlights on the road. They had called my across the street neighbor, who was also one of our youth leaders, who allowed them to park across the street. So when they started driving down the country road, they turned their headlights off, pulled into his house, creeped across the street up to my window. So needless to say, this book scared me on a couple of different levels and probably more admittedly than the average reader. And then either late high school or high school to college, early college, I don't really remember exactly. I was going through a phase where I was trying to read a bunch of classics and I was checking a bunch of classics out from our kind of dank basement library. Don't ask me why we kept the classics in the dank basement. I asked a couple of times, it's just the way it was. But so I of course read Rebecca because of my attraction to gothics. And this started my infatuation that ran through college with Daphne du Maurier and led me to reading also my cousin Rachel, which I do need to revisit. And this book didn't so much scare me as it was so tense and I felt the danger so immediately that it definitely aggravated my anxiety. I was anxious and kind of keyed up the whole time I was reading this book. So I'd be very interested to see if I would have a similar reaction today. And yet I just haven't revisited it yet. Neither have I watched the movie, but there was just very much an emotional reaction from this book. And another book that you wouldn't think would be traditionally scary, because to be fair, a lot of these books aren't traditionally scary, Roses and Rot by Cat Howard. And this is another book where I have such a distinct memory. I can put myself in the time and place that I was scared and I just have that more visceral memory. But this is about an artist retreat and also the fae in some ways. I don't think that's a spoiler because I'm sure that's what got me intrigued by the book in the first place. But it's the dangerous kind of fae and it's that idea of what is the cost 
of art in some ways and so there was always this looming sense that these characters were being watched and you didn't really know what was going to happen. There were weird things happening on this retreat campus, there was a danger lurking and there was this kind of bleeding of the real and the unreal in a lot of ways and so it led to this feeling of being observed. And I was reading it at the time in my pretty typical Chicago apartment that I shared with roommates where we had a little alcove that was full of windows and we'd put some couches there. Seemed like a great idea. It was a great idea. It was a perfect reading space. I had all the little lamps that surround the room of some old Chicago apartments turned on. And yet while reading this book, I couldn't escape that sense of being watched, especially in that space where I was just looking out onto a dark, quiet residential street. So I had to put the book away for the night after that. And I just have a memory of that feeling. Maybe this is just more a list of books that have aggravated my anxiety. I don't know. I will let you be the judge of that, I guess. And then we have The Dangers of Smoking in Bed by Mariana Enriquez. Now I am sure some stories and things we lost in the fire creeped me out, but I was probably just smart enough to read that collection during the day. I got cocky on this one. I was like, it's atmospheric, but I'm not scared. I will be fine. And then I got to a story called Rambla Triste and it scared the poop out of me. It was another one of those things where you have that sense of being watched and maybe it's that through line and theme for me. This idea that something is lurking in the darkness, it can pop out at any time. We don't want that. It's the promise of the jump scare as much as the jump scare itself. So I had to put this book down for the night because it was this kind of haunting that was going on. There was also, of course, with Enriquez's work, a huge social commentary aspect to that story that tempered that a little bit, added so many layers, but it was constructed so expertly and I wasn't able to escape the kind of looming terror based on kind of trying to intellectualize those aspects of the story. So definitely something I just had to put away for the night. And then White Smoke by Tiffany D. Jackson, which I have talked about on a feature Friday years ago at this point, which is a haunted house book, but it's not your traditional haunted house book in some ways. And yet the getting to that kind of reversal of expectations, we still had this breakdown of trust that was being seeded. We had a narrator, a protagonist that we as readers couldn't necessarily trust. We couldn't necessarily trust that she could trust her own perception. And yet she was perceiving some pretty creepy goings on. And we as readers were perceiving that with her. And then we were watching that perception get questioned by others in her life, which made us as readers question our perception as well. And it was just this idea that we couldn't really root ourselves safely anywhere because we couldn't trust that things were safe in this house. We couldn't trust that they weren't. And then what is the danger in if she is perceiving these things that aren't there? There was just a lot of really expert tension in this book, both within the main action of like what is going on in this house, combined with some of the more social commentary aspects of the book. And I think that when things like that are woven together really well is when it gets extra scary because we couldn't be sure that these characters were safe in this house on any level. And so I think it was really expertly done in that tension and it undeniably creeped me out at parts. So again, if you want a more in-depth exploration of that book, feel free to check out The Future Friday. Just forgive, you know, the fact that it's been years since I recorded it. I can't guarantee what that quality is gonna look like. And then we have another book that really kind of leans into that tension, Kingdom of Souls by Raina Barron. It's definitely a tenseness that is built by an antagonist that is almost all-knowing and is able to anticipate our protagonist's every move, which I think is pretty inarguably an anxious situation. However, it also recreated pretty accurately a reoccurring stress nightmare I had, especially during childhood, where I would just start in a grocery store with a group of unknown friends, faceless, could never quite place them. And somehow we would come upon a witch. What the witch wanted, I don't know. It was something from us and something we didn't want to give because we were running away from the witch. But the witch would just always be there. And so I just remember somehow me and my group of friends, presumably below fourth grade, got from the grocery store back to my house at the time. And then the witch would appear anytime we tried to leave the house at like any entry point. Listen, I don't need the dream psychoanalyzed. It's probably a pretty common stress dream. If you've had one similar, let me know because that is interesting to me. But this book really illustrated for me that I am surely not the only one that has had that dream because it is reflected so accurately here while still being within the realm 
of the narrative at play. I have not read the third book in this series yet, and I think that that may ramp up again. So I'm very interested to see how that will play out, but also kind of having to brace myself because I was a little freaked out in this. I definitely felt myself getting anxious in a way that I don't really recall getting that worked up since my cousin Rachel. That being said, don't be afraid of this book. I loved it. The pacing is wonderful, but just something to be aware of. And maybe that's a draw for you. I don't know, but it really is an excellent series and I'm excited to finish. But I just have such vivid, visceral memories of my reaction to this book. And then in terms of fiction, because I do have a couple of nonfiction titles I want to touch on, I am currently reading The Haunting of Alejandra. And I, again, being cocky, was like, I'm going to read this book on my Kobo or on my phone at night before bed when I am too lazy to hold up another book. This is going to be perfect. Also on the CTA, on those commute mornings where everyone's going downtown and I can't get a seat. But I was quickly humbled because I was reading it late at night in bed again. I am not finished with this book, partly because of this, but right now our protagonist is being haunted in some way and it's unclear if it's in her head, if it's a physical real haunting, if it's a bleeding of the two. It could be so many things, but there is something following her. There is the sense that it may be La Llorona, and I apologize for butchering that pronunciation, but so far we've gotten kind of wisps of this when she is alone in the shower, so in this very personal, intimate, small confined place where she is just trying to get a moment of peace, a break, because this book is very much exploring right now some of the burdens of feeling trapped in your life in a kind of modernized context of things we were seeing in conversations around second wave feminism. But okay, so we have that scene. There was a scene where she was driving and something just kind of flashed in her rearview mirror. And I was like, absolutely not. And then the thing that made me put the book down for the night wasn't even the thing haunting her appearing as much as being on guard for it. She was reading her daughter a bedtime story and she thinks she sees something in the closet and she looks over and it's just like the sequins of a dress kind of peeking out of the closet. And the description there was just so vivid and also so simple at the same time. And I was like, okay, that's enough for the night because I was prepped for there to be something there right with our protagonist. So I definitely think that there is a particular atmosphere being created and I'm very interested to see where the rest of the book is going to go. But if nothing else, the opening of the book is incredibly striking. So that's kind of a spattering of some of the fiction titles that my reaction to has stuck with me over the years. Again, not necessarily books that are horror on their face, but have scared me in some ways. And again, I'm not necessarily seeking out horror, so that is definitely part of it. And also, if this is how I'm reacting to things that aren't horror, how will I react to mainstream horror? But also some of the things that I've been reading lately that are classified as horror, they haven't necessarily scared me. It's just more that atmosphere and that tone, which I do like. So I'm not obviously drawing conclusions here. I'm just throwing out random disparate thoughts. But if you also have random thoughts, please share them below because I'm interested. But before we go, I do want to touch on a couple of nonfiction titles that have scared me. The first was a borderline. It didn't end up really fully scaring me, thank goodness, but Ghostland by Colin Dickey, which I absolutely recommend if you haven't read it, because it kind of does like a social analysis of our fascination with ghost stories, what ghost stories are told and perpetuated and that whole kind of culture. But there is a portion of this book that talks about a specific cemetery in Chicago. And it is a cemetery that I personally walk by pretty regularly in just my normal daily life. And I was like, I cannot be afraid of this cemetery. Along those similar lines, Lore by Aaron Mankey. Do I recognize that this is a podcast? Yes. But as I said, I am highly susceptible to tone and mood music. And so I was like, the book is going to be the safer option. I'm interested in it. It's around Halloween time and it counts toward my reading goal. It is a win for everyone. And yet when I read that first book, there were still moments when I got freaked out and had to put it down. A book, a podcast that by all accounts is pretty accessible, not too scary for most people, especially most people interested in scary things. So it kind of illustrates just how weak I am in many ways. I also think that there was a story, if I am remembering right, in either the first or the second one that was set very close to my hometown and that I had recognized from like hearing about in passing, but we didn't study in my Indiana Lit class because around Halloween when I was in Indiana literature as a freshman, we had a whole like little mini unit about like urban legends in the area. Really, I'm convinced our teacher was just trying to 
to freak us out, especially the teenagers that he would inevitably see coming to his house while trick-or-treating. But I'm not gonna lie to you, those books did have a couple of moments that freaked me out. The majority of them did not, but there were those like little glimmers that got me. And then that the final two are true crime is probably no surprise. The first is Empire of Sin by Gary Christ, which takes a look at New Orleans around the jazz age and is a fabulous and fascinating book. But there is a storyline about a literal axe murderer and one the fact that this guy was never caught. We saw the impact of his terror on the city at this time, the kind of senselessness of it. And it was just this idea that anyone could be a victim without real rhyme or reason that this could pop up anywhere. Despite the fact that while I was reading this, I was safely in the 21st century, at least from this particular boogeyman. And then finally, not going to be a shocker, I'll Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle McNamara. I read this before the Golden State Killer was caught and just how vivid she made the sense of terror that this man, this monster brought upon a community, a state really, was so real and immediate. As established, I live in an apartment building and I still felt so creeped out by the idea of him crawling around on rooftops that I just felt like there was someone above me. And to be fair, literally there is someone above me. But this just really, really creeped me out. And honestly, I did take comfort in the fact that I was in an apartment building in a lot of ways. If I had been in a single family home at my childhood home where my mom did read this book, I don't know how she did it because just especially the roof thing really creeped me out. I also very specifically remember the month that my book club talked about this. I was coming home from my friend's apartment where we had book club and all of the lights on my street were out. The electricity on the block was out and it was so creepy walking home from that after having just had a conversation around this book. So definitely on my list of books that really creeped me out, really scared me. There are a couple of honorable mentions in that I remember the atmosphere being amped up so much that it still kind of creeped me out a little bit. Those are The Taking of Jake Livingston and The Death of Jane Lawrence, but I do not recall how scared I was. That being said, I have also gotten smarter in recent years and know what books I can read during the nighttime and what books need to be daytime books. So with that being said, those are books I can recall scaring me and would probably be classified as daytime books for me. So thank you for being interested in my daytime books. Leave yours below because I'm interested in yours as well. But as always, thanks for hanging out with me and listening to what I have to say about books. Like and subscribe if you feel like it again. But most importantly, as always, read something good. And if you're feeling something scary for October, now is the time and maybe this will put you in the mood. And yeah, Bye.